Hey guys, Woodruff here. So um, now let's talk about pneumonia. Um, so this is a part of my longer lecture for lower respiratory system disorders. It does have some interactive and other stuff um, if that's helpful for you. So um, pneumonia is definitely a um, big topic that you'll want to be familiar with. Um, and um, it's one of the top four that usually has the most questions when it comes to most exams over this topic, especially at least at my school. And um, you, it is something you'll um, you'll see reoccurring um, as you're um, going through uh, into further classes in nursing. So pneumonia is an acute infection, which means it's not a chronic disorder. Um, and it, it's an infection in the place where oxygen exchange occurs, which is known as the parenchyma, which by the way, I used to pronounce this word parenchyma for the longest time, but it is parenchyma. Um, and you know, if we think about it, it's kind of where I, I talked about one of the places that we're going to be studying where you can have problems is in your um, alveoli or in the area where, um, you know, um, oxygen is supposed to get in and carbon dioxide is supposed to get out. Um, pretty much what happens is the infection gets into the alveoli, it leads to inflammation, it makes it difficult for oxygen to get in. So this is primarily an oxygen problem. And it's important for you to kind of differentiate that because a lot of times, um, uh, what do you call it, um, when you're, uh, you know, reading and you're trying to, um, sorry, when you're reading a test question, you're trying to figure out what should you do first, you really want to think about, okay, is this an oxygen question or a ventilation question? Because we do different stuff to help a patient with oxygen problems than we do ventilation. Now, if pneumonia gets really severe, they can have ventilation issues, but um, primarily um, it's an oxygen problem. So in other words, having trouble getting oxygen, there's all this debris and stuff in the bottom of the alveoli, which makes it hard um, for patients to um, be able to uh, get oxygen in. Um, so it can be caused, there's a lot of different types of pneumonia. Probably the most common you'll see is bacterial, but there's also viral pneumonia. Um, there's fungal pneumonia, parasitic pneumonia, um, many different types. There's also um, different ways that it can be transmitted. It can be transmitted just by being close to someone who has pneumonia. Like, so if you work or live in a congregated area where um, other people, um, you know, have, um, have this disease, um, then you're going to be more likely. People can also get aspiration pneumonia, and that's where, um, you know, people have, are more likely, they can't handle their secretions very well. And so they're more likely to um, have stuff that's like food particles or um, gastric contents that gets, um, it gets pretty much, it moves backwards in the esophagus and it gets to that place um, where there's the, um, the bridge between the trachea and the esophagus. And it, you end up what's called aspirating, which means gastric contents or food are going from your food tube into your, um, your airway or your breathing tube. Um, and what's happening, uh, what uh, what happens there is, is that once that stuff gets in your lungs, it's not meant to be there. Your lungs are meant to be a sterile place. And, um, you know, bacteria can breed on that food or those gastric contents. Um, or it can be spread from other organs. So sometimes people can have an infection somewhere else in their body, and it can end up um, in their lungs um, at the end. So another common pre precursor is what's known as atelectasis. And we're going to talk about that um, on another slide. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're not going to watch this video, um, but this is a good um, osmosis video on, and it talks specifically about aspiration pneumonia. So let's talk about atelectasis. Um, so atelectasis is um, what uh, is known as like a collapsed alveoli. And so normally your alveoli are supposed to stay um, it, that, you know, they, um, you know, they inflate and uh, especially as oxygen stuff's going in, um, they're supposed to remain inflated. Um, and uh, it when they're inflated, it allows for oxygen to get in and carbon dioxide to get out. But what can happen is, is when people are not taking deep breaths and when I have pneumonia, we're going to talk about the symptoms of pneumonia here soon. But when I have pneumonia, um, I can very commonly um, have an issue with um, where um, we kind of, I'm not taking deep breaths because it hurts to take a deep breath. So um, this could also, people also that are at risk for pneumonia or those that are immobile, maybe after surgery that have not, um, that are not taking deep breaths. Because what happens when I'm not taking deep breaths is these alveoli start to collapse. And if they start to collapse, I have less places that I can get oxygen in. And on top of that, um, when these alveoli are collapsed, they're much higher risk to breed infection. 
Um, so a collapsed alveoli or atelectasis may cause no problems. People aren't walking around usually and saying, oh my God, my atelectasis, like it's not something that's painful or usually even has any symptoms that a patient's going to complain about. Um, they, it's possible they might be a little short of breath if it's very severe, but normally there's no symptoms. The only thing you're going to notice as the nurse is that in their lower lobes, especially you're going to hear very diminished sounds, or in other words, you're going to ask them to take a deep breath and you're going to barely hear air moving. Um, and this is just a sign again, that they're not getting as much oxygenation down in, um, in that, uh, gas exchange area. Um, we treat it by uh, encouraging them to take deep breaths and use the incentive spirometer. And most people, um, you'll get confused about this, but the incentive spirometer, what we were meant to do with that is to, um, what do you call it? Um, to exhale and then take a deep breath in. So um, think incentive spirometer, it's an inhalation spirometer. Um, so this is not something we're blowing into. This is something we're inhaling. When we talk later about asthma, we're going to talk about a peak flow meter. That one we're exhaling because that's a ventilation problem, but this is an oxygenation problem. So we need to inhale. Um, and then we're going to do things that encourage deep breathing. So turning, moving, repositioning, things like that, but effectively movements and deep breaths, um, are what's going to help atelectasis the most. So let's take a pause and do a select all that apply for pneumonia risk factors. So this one says, um, and you can always pause me, um, you know, if you want to do this problem without, you know, hearing my feedback first. Um, so now's the time to pause me if you want to do this problem without my help. Um, a nurse is evaluating a client for their risk factors for pneumonia. Which questions or assessments would be most helpful to ask to evaluate their risk for pneumonia? So this is a slow, and I didn't even put select all that apply on the question, but usually that would be on the question. But um, you can see at the top, it is a select all that apply. So I'm looking for who's at risk. So it says, which questions or assessments would be most helpful? So this is saying that some of these may possibly be helpful, but what's gonna be most helpful to, um, to ask? And it's either questions I'm gonna ask or assessments I'm going to do. So um, the first one says, assess the client's level of consciousness. So I have to think about pneumonia. I talked about pneumonia. You know, you can have aspiration pneumonia. You can, it can be spread from other people. So if someone's more has... Um, if someone has a change in their level of conscious, like really you should ask yourself, if someone has a change in their level of consciousness, could it put them at risk for pneumonia? What I'm thinking is, is if they have a high level of consciousness, they wouldn't be at risk, but if they started to be more sleepy or less awake, um, that they may not be able to handle their secretions well, and they could end up aspirating. So I'm thinking this one might be right, but let's keep going. By the way, so my, uh, my um, strategies for select all that apply is um, I recommend not reading all of the answer choices first. I recommend starting at the top, go um, one by one and just true false, and then not try to go back and say, well, I have to have at least this many or, you know, and get crazy in your head about it. Um, so I'm going to say yes for A and I'm moving forward. Um, ask the client how old they are. Well, I do think that older patients are more at risk for pneumonia. So I would say that is a helpful question. So I'm going to say yes. Um, ask the client if they have to sleep in a recliner at night. Um, so for this one, um, I feel like this is something around respiratory or heart problems, but I'm not sure it's going to tell me if they're at risk for pneumonia. Um, cause, um, if they have to sleep in a recliner at night, they might have what's called orthopnea. Um, and that might be a sign that they have some sort of problem, but not usually pneumonia. So like, in other words, um, uh, having to sleep in a recliner at night does not put you at more risk for pneumonia. Um, so I don't think that one would help. So I'm going to move on. Um, ask the client if they work full-time or part-time. Well, I mean, stress is a risk factor for anything, but I mean, there's a lot of assumptions I would have to make in this, but I don't think work schedule is a risk factor now. I mean, again, like, so C and D, you know, might be questions that I want to ask for any patient, but um, is it going to tell me like very specifically or directly if they have one of the biggest risk factors for pneumonia? I don't think so. Um, assess the client's blood pressure. Um, so, I mean, of course, yes, I want to assess blood pressure on all patients, but um, I don't think that knowing what their blood pressure is, is going to tell me if they're at risk for pneumonia very specifically, because not everyone who has hypertension gets pneumonia. Now, I know that people with any, you know, sort of cardiovascular disease are always going to be more at risk for things, but I don't think that this is direct. I think the only things that are direct are going to be A and B. And I'm correct. <laughs> so um, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, you know, effectively, um, we want to look for what's most specific or what are going to be those most common risk factors for pneumonia. So um, who gets pneumonia? 
Um, we cut, like we mentioned before, older age, anyone who's older than 65 is going to be higher risk for pneumonia. Um, those that are not very awake, so that decreased level of consciousness, or if they have a change in mental status, um, anyone who has a brain or head injury, because again, they can't protect their secretion, so they're more likely to aspirate. Um, and then if they're on medications that make them sleepy. Also think the other risk factor that goes with that is that they're not taking a whole lot of deep breaths. So because they're not, um, if they're let more sleepy, they or at least they may not be taking as many deep breaths. So I need to um, keep an eye because that can lead to atelectasis, which can also lead to pneumonia. Um, anyone who's on medications that suppress their immune system because they're it's like what we call opportunistic or their immune system is going to be more likely to get an infection um, intubated or having other devices um, so if I have a breathing tube it's literally like a straight shot to my lungs so it's gonna I'm gonna be more at risk if um, I uh, have a breathing tube in um, because there's a portal straight to my lungs that um, can cause um, you know just an easy entrance or an easy place for uh, the bacteria or whatever it is to get to my lungs. Um, receiving enteral tube feeding. So this is where people have a feeding tube that goes into their stomach. And when they have that, um, they're just higher risk for aspiration um, because they're, it's just, it's really easy, especially because we lie these patients flat sometimes, turn them side to side, and sometimes they can have, um, you know, that reflux of the um, food and other stuff and they're just higher risk. Um, therefore, for um, aspiration, which can then lead to pneumonia. So effectively, um, older people, sleepy people, um, people that are immunocompromised and people with devices or um, uh, that are receiving feeding that could put them at risk because they have a tube that is either going to lead to aspiration um, or a direct route to um, insert infection into their body. So how do we diagnose pneumonia? We look for infiltrates and consolidation on a chest X-ray. Now, do I say, am I saying the nurse looks for that? Absolutely not. Um, but what you might notice, this is a picture of it, is this like, you know, where you might see some like, kind of looks like patchy or hazy in those areas. That's usually a sign of infection or fluid. Um, but it's just kind of recognizing, normally in an X-ray, you should see lots of black. Black means air is moving. But if you see a lot of like hazy and patchy stuff, it's usually a sign like here too, like that there's something that, um, there's a bunch of junk there. Um, again, this is an oxygen problem. So we're going to look for problems with oxygenation or acid base imbalance. Um, and we're going to maybe get an AVG. And so since this is an oxygen problem, what numbers are we going to focus on? We're going to focus on oxygenation. So that PaO2 is going to be super important. We also want to check out their CO2 um, to see if they're ventilating okay. And of course, the pH is always important, but I would say we're focusing on oxygenation and ventilation the most. Um, we will, of course, this is also an infection, so we're going to look for infection. Um, we're specifically usually going to want to get a sputum culture because we want a, a culture is the most specific way to know what's growing right now. Um, so we're going to want to get this in order to um, get a better idea about um, what is actually growing. Is it a virus? Is it a bacteria? Because we can give antibiotics all day, but if it's a viral um, pneumonia, it's not going to um, you know, be effective. So we want to see what's growing. Um, we want to also see what antibiotics are going to be most sensitive to it. So a culture tells us what's growing. A sensitivity tells us um, what antibiotics or treatment is going to be most effective. Um, we're also going to monitor for infection in general, like a white blood cell count. And if um, it's a good practice to remember what normal is. So a normal white blood cell count is usually like five to 10 or five to 11,000. Um, so anything higher than that. Now, white blood cell count is not specific. So I can't say, oh my goodness, they have pneumonia. I can just say there's either infection or inflammation going on. Um, but um, in some medications like steroids can increase your white blood cell count. But this at least gives us some um, bit to kind of uh, tell at least a little bit um, how much much my, how much of an immune response my body has right now. We also want to look for complications and complications they can have are problems with electrolyte balance, kidney function. Um, so doing like a chemistry um, and the, the lab that's the most helpful there is going to be the creatinine because the creatinine is more specific than the BUN, um, than their electrolyte balance because um, pneumo with pneumonia, a lot of times they might not have an appetite. It's hard to breathe and eat at the same time. So they may be dehydrated and have poor nutrition. Uh, we may also want to check to see if infection is spreading because it can um, it can start other places and go to the lungs or it can start in the lungs and go other places. So we may get blood cultures if they start having more systemic symptoms or have, um, you know, um, newer worsening fevers, things like that. So what should we expect? 
Um, so a patient that has pneumonia is probably going to complain of a cough and they may or may not have productive sputum. If they do, it may be purulent like green yellow. Um, they probably will have some sort of chills, fever going on, and they can have a pretty high fever with pneumonia. Um, we definitely want to be looking for, um, you know, um, it, the patterns or the trends in it, making sure it's not getting worse. Um, we're going to look for chest pain with their breathing. Um, and that's like what we call pleuritic chest pain, which means like when they're taking a breath, it hurts because there's inflammation there from the infection. Um, it can also be a sign of complications. We'll talk about that. And then they may have some difficulty breathing. So up until now, everything that we've talked about, um, you know, with uh, sinusitis, rhinitis, um, influenza, um, all of those, like, or none of those, they're all upper respiratory. So there's no lung involvement. Um, and so they, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, any dyspnea or difficulty breathing, but now we're starting to get into lung problems, oxygenation issues, so they can start to have difficulty breathing. Um, so this is what's expected, but how do I know when there's a problem? So, um, uh, well, sorry, no, not yet. Sorry, this is what we should expect. Um, this is, um, so this is what they're complaining about. Then the nurse may do their own assessments and find um, like abnormal wet lung sounds. Those are like coarse crackles, ronchi, um, that thick purulent sputum, like I mentioned, um, a temperature. And it's usually like, it can be higher, um, but it's usually going to be bigger than um, 100.4. We're going to maybe check their oxygen saturation and um, see that it is lower, um, it, you know, than what they normally are. Um, and we might see mild elevations in their respiratory rate and work of breathing because that would be expected. But we don't, it should not be severe. Um, and an older adult, we may not even know that they have pneumonia um, until we look at their mental status um, or look for confusion. A lot of older people, when they get infections, their first sign and symptom is, is that they're confused um, or they're not quite acting like themselves. So my priority assessments then, I'm kind of going along with that, is gonna to be to look at their sputum, what color is it, what's the consistency, because a lot of times it can be super thick. We're going to check their temperature and see if they have a fever. Um, I do wanna assess for pain, because I'm expecting them to maybe have mild chest pain, with, especially when they take a deep breath and with their breathing. Um, but I definitely wanna make sure that they're not having severe pain, or you know, because a lot of times that can be a sign of a complication. Um, I'm going to assess their lung sounds. And again, we would expect them to have those coarse crackles, ronchi, those wet sounds, because this is infection. Infection is wet sounds. Restricted airway, when we talk about asthma, COPD, that's where we have more wheezing. With this, we're usually expecting more wet sounds. And then I want to do really good respiratory effort. And to do this, I really need to pull their gown down and look at all their muscles. Remember, our respiratory muscles, we could use nasal, our nasal um, passages, or I should say nasal flaring, um, in order to uh, help with our work of breathing. We can use it our clavicle area. I want to look around there. I'm going to look on their chest. I'm going to look on their abdomen, look for belly breathing. Um, all these changes should be mild. And I'm also going to count their respiratory rate. So better or worse. Um, when it comes to um, pneumonia, signs that they're getting better, they can have a decreased cough. Um, decreased temperature, maybe their oxygen saturation is improving, less work of breathing or use of accessory muscles, um, clear lung sounds, um, and a negative sputum culture. So um, all these together now, someone could be have a negative sputum culture and still have other symptoms. It doesn't mean their pneumonia is completely resolved. They could still, it kind of depends, but it definitely if their sputum culture comes back negative, it's a sign that they're um, going in a good direction. Um, but we kind of look at this all as a whole to see how we can um, see how they're doing better. Um, so what's the worst that can happen? So they can go into complete respiratory failure. They can um, accumulate fluid in their lungs, which is known as pleural effusion. They can have a collapsed lung, a pneumothorax, or inflammation of the lung cavity, which is known as pleurisy. And we're going to talk about each of these. So let's talk about pleural effusion first. So um, this is a complication. It's not just a complication of pneumonia. It can be a complication. It can happen after multiple things. Um, but um, just know that what it is, is there effectively fluid is collecting in areas where um, in between the um, lung lining or the pleural space. Uh, and this can happen as a result of infection. It could be an infection in the lungs or it could be infection. Sometimes um, if there's liver problems, they might also be higher risk for getting a pleural uh, fusion. Um, or if there's problems with the heart, sometimes we can get a pleural effusion. Um, but effectively, the issue here is it makes it hard to breathe um, because what it's pretty much like, think of it like it's put, it's like pushing up the lung so the lung can't expand as much. So it's like sitting there and it, it's getting in the way of the lung fully expanding. So it makes it hard to breathe and it can also lead to systemic infection. They can actually within that space, not just accumulate fluid, but bacterial fluid, it can get um, infected too and lead to some issues. 
Um, so these patients, the cues you should look for that your pneumonia patient is getting a pleural effusion is that their breathing or their dyspnea is getting worse. They have very diminished breath sounds at the bottom, um, on the bottom lung space, and then signs of infection. Now, I know that they already have a lot of those, but if there's new or worsening, um, that would definitely kind of cue you for that. Um, you're, for treating a pleural effusion, we usually give supplemental oxygen, we elevate their head of bed, and then we want to do something, we need to get rid of that fluid. So usually to get rid of that fluid, we do things um, like diuretics, uh, thoracentesis, uh, they may need a chest tube to drain if they have an excess amount or there's accumulating fluid over and over. Um, and if it's infected, we usually get a culture of it and see what's growing. Um, they may need antibiotics. Um, but what I want to add here is just that, what was I going to say? Um, oh, that we can usually see a pleural effusion on a chest x-ray. So um, just know that a lot of times that's how we diagnose it. So like I mentioned, I'm not going to show this video, but a thoracentesis is where we have a patient. Um, and I, I explain it more on the next slide. Um, this is just a video of it. Uh, oh, no, I don't want to watch. Okay, there. A thoracentesis is where um, uh, we remove air or fluid from the pleural space. So if there's this accumulation, um, and you always want to think about when you're studying procedures for nursing, um, you want to think about what your role as the nurse. Like, you know, you don't need to understand the deep science behind or how everything works because you're not doing the procedure. But what are you doing as the nurse to prepare the patient? or to help the physician. Um, so to prepare the patient, we wanna sit the patient upright if possible. We kinda of like to sit them over a bedside table if possible. Uh, they're gonna need an ultrasound in order to get the right placement, a needle syringe, and a local anesthetic may need to be used. Um, effectively, what they do is they find the right spot that they want to insert the needle um, and they mark it. Then they use a, like usually it's like a 60 cc syringe and um, a needle. Um, they puncture and um, not puncture the lung, but they go into that space and uh, drain that fluid. Now, sometimes they just pull out, get a sample, and then, um, you know, that's it. Sometimes they also put a tube in or what's called a pigtail chest tube to continue to drain that. We do not take a lot of fluid off the lungs because um, there's not that. That much fluid in that space. I've never seen them take more than like a liter. This says you can go up to like 1.2 liters. We don't want to take a lot because what happens after this procedure, if we take too much fluid, this patient can end up having fluid shifts and they can end up hypotensive. So my prior, like you always want to think about what you're going to do to prepare for the procedure and then what you're going to do after. Um, after my role as the nurse, I'm going to support the patient. They may be anxious or having pain. Um, so I'm going to help them with that. Um, I need to watch out for signs that they had a serious complication. So like I said, the, the fluid shifts, they can have a profoundly low blood pressure. So I need to watch for that. And then also um, I want to, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, listen for absent lung sounds or increased work of breathing. It could indicate that they accidentally punctured the lung, which it does happen, but hopefully not going wood, not too often. <laughs> so, um, there's also inflammation in the lung, which is known as pleurisy. Um, and what pleurisy is, um, is, is where like, you know, it's, it can be a result of infection, but also can be because of cancer, trauma, other things. And what's happening here is um, uh, there's inflammation in that cavity or in the pleural space, and it leads to really abrupt, sharp pain. And the patient's going to complain of worse pain when they're taking a deep breath. Um, you may notice that they're um, breathing really shallow or rapidly breathing. And when you listen, you're going to hear kind of like a squeaking door sound. It's what's called a pleural friction rub. Um, the treatment for this is we want to treat whatever the underlying cause is. So if it's infection, we want to treat the infection. Um, sometimes cancer or cancer treatments like radiation can do this. So they might have to stop those until the inflammation goes down. If it's trauma. We want to fix whatever the issue is there. Um, but effectively, we want to decrease the inflammation and pain with NSAIDs. Um, some of these patients, it's so painful, they may need a nerve block. So remember when I said you want to keep a close eye on their pain if it's getting worse? This is why. If it's severe like this or you start to notice this friction rub um, when you're listening, um, then you're going to um, definitely start to think like, hmm, maybe there's some more inflammation going on here. Um, we can give them pain relief also through repositioning. And as weird as it's going to sound, um, we want them to lie on their affected side. So it's like splinting. So if, if it really hurts, if I'm take a deep breath, if it really hurts, if I'm splinting and kind of doing counter pressure on that um, with splinting, it makes it where it doesn't hurt so bad when I take that breath. It helps kind of like um, it eases the blow or eases the, the pain that it comes from that expansion. Um, so um, have them lie on the affected side. So if it was my right lung, I would have them lie on their right side. Or again, when they're coughing or taking deep breaths, splint with a pillow, which is where you're taking a pillow and pushing, um, you know, up against them. 
All right, so uh, medical treatments, we need to fix the problem, um, which is uh, the infection. So if it's viral or fungal, they may need antivirals or antifungals. If it's bacteria, they're gonna need antibiotics. Um, so some common antibiotics are here, vancomycin, beta-lactams, macrolids, or fluoroquinolones. I'll talk about them on the next slide. Um, other adjunctive ther uh, therapies. Now these are somewhat controversial, but um, you know, uh, steroids and bronchodilators can be used. Now you'll hear mixed things like some people, um, some doctors may, uh, or some research shows that may, these may or may not be helpful. It's not actually treating the problem. It may, um, you know, I, I talk about with bronchodilators, how everyone says like they save the day. They don't actually treat infection. I mean, pneumonia is not a closed airway issue, but sometimes these can help um, a little bit um, or ease some of the symptoms, especially if they have a severe oxygenation or ventilation issues. We can give cough suppressants. Again, if it's very severe, we try to stay away from cough suppressants, especially high doses. Um, orquifycin, um, which again is that medication that's going to help to thin your sputum like mucinex in order to um, be, get um, stuff up easier. So how do we know antibiotics work? Well, we're gonna look for two things. We're gonna look that the infection is getting better. So maybe like, again, we've talked about this, decreased cough, decreased temperature, better oxygen saturation, less work of breathing, clear lung sounds, negative sputum culture. And then we're also gonna look for signs of improved respiratory symptoms. Um, so um, better you know, oxygen saturation, um, less work of breathing or um, use of accessory muscles. So we can look at their respiratory status and their infection status. Um, so how do we know there's a problem? So um, all these medications, they have different um, different side effects. So for example, for uh, vancomycin, uh, they can have what's called red man syndrome and red man syndrome is, uh, what do you call it? Um, like a flushing that they can have. And well, it, it's not necessarily serious. It's very uncomfortable. So we definitely want to, um, we call them um, try to consider, uh, we call their comfort in, uh, you know, so a lot of times if someone has red man syndrome, it's like, an, it's almost like an allergic response. So, um, you know, we usually don't continue with it. If that's, uh, you know, a reaction that they're having. So look for like, it would be like when it's red man, they like, you won't miss it. Like they are um, like red throughout, usually throughout their entire body or a large part of their body. Um, vancomycin can cause hypotension if given too rapidly. So make sure that you're following your orders. Um, it's usually given over an hour and a half, two hours. Some of them can be given over an hour, but it's very, it's a lot slower than others. Um, and it can also cause hearing issues like actual, um, like loss of hearing. Um, it is a toxic to the ears. So um, you wanna be super careful and maybe get a baseline hearing so that you know how their, um, their hearing is before you start. Um, and then also vancomycin is a little bit more dangerous. It does need therapeutic monitoring or there's a safe range. So you always want to try to stay within that safe range. Um, the beta uh, and the and you you guys don't have to know that for your exam at least for my school um, I believe it's ten to twenty ish um, but um, you what we do is we draw what's called a trough and a trough is drawn um, right like usually about thirty minutes or so before the next dose and it just tells us where they're at because like that should that's like right before their next dose they should have the least amount of medication in their system um, because it's uh, it's almost time for the next dose so it's going to show like how much is in their system um, when we're almost to the next dose which is like should be the lowest amount and um, yeah it gives us a better idea but you always want to make sure you draw those before you start the next dose so you want to make sure you time it right um, there's also beta lactams, um, which uh, I have listed here. These have a cross sensitivity to penicillin. So if you're allergic to penicillin, you might also be allergic to these. So kind of keep that in mind. Um, there's also macrolids. Um, and these, what you want to watch out for them is they can be cardiotoxic. So, you know, they may need some ECG monitoring or if the patient's having palpitations, you may need to get an EKG, um, look for chest pain or any um, sort of um, signs of dysrhythmias, which you haven't learned about yet in my class, but it's coming. Um, and then fluoroquinolones, um, these can be toxic to the heart, liver, and neurological system or um, the brain. Um, you want to assess any history of seizures or cardiac disorders, maybe get some liver function testing before. Um, so, but just kind of have an idea and keep an eye. Now, most patients are on these short term, but um, people with certain risk factors, we definitely want to be cautious because antibiotics can be very toxic, obviously, to your um, different organs. So general antibiotic precautions for all patients that you'll want to know. Um, is, is that um, antibiotics need a lot of monitoring as a whole. Like I said, some might have therapeutic monitoring, um, but for all of them, all antibiotics are hard on the kidneys. So we usually want to know kidney function. And then pharmacy a lot of times will, um, you know, dose them or give a dose based on the patient's kidney function. Um, so as a whole, um, 
uh, what do you call it, when it comes to kidney function, um, you know, it's not that they can't get antibiotics, but sometimes we have to change the dose or change like how, like how much we're giving or how often we're giving it. So pharmacy will figure that out, but it is your job as the nurse to kind of think about, okay, like um, what are like, you know, what is like to think, to look at that, to see that, Hey, my patient's kidneys are hurting. I'm already giving them this antibiotic. How else can I be easy on my patient's kidneys? Um, there's also a risk for C. diff or, you know, what can happen is an opportunistic infection. Hold on one second. One second. Here, Cause there's a student here to see me. One moment. Sorry about that. It's hard being popular, but if it makes you feel better um, for anyone who's not very popular, I was very wildly unpopular in high school. So it's funny how when you become a professor and you are responsible for maybe helping people um, get into their career, how popular you can become. So, yes, and that is just a joke. I am not that popular. Um, <laughs> so, yes, I make jokes when I'm uncomfortable, just so you know, if you don't know me. Anyway, getting back into general antibiotic precautions. Um, so when it comes to, um, uh, antibiotics, um, we were talking about C. diff. So C. diff is an opportunistic infection. So what happens is, is that, um, antibiotics help, um, to get rid of bad, uh, bad bacteria, you know, obviously with pneumonia, but also when you're taking them and antibiotics, we may start IV, um, but we also um, eventually usually give them oral. Um, but for both cases, even if you get IV antibiotics, it can still, um, C. diff can still happen. Is that that can destroy some good bacteria too, and the good bacteria um, that's in your stomach. So we have bacteria all places in our body, and sometimes it serves to actually help, and sometimes it hurts. But with C. diff, um, what do you call it? Um, it, what was I going to say? Um, it's it's really hard um, to find the balance where we can like help the pneumonia, but not um, hurt the bad. Uh, the It's good bacteria in the stomach, but the antibiotics think it's bad. So it goes and it, it destroys it. So when you get rid of this bacteria in your stomach, what happens? You end up with this, um, an infection in your stomach um, or in your digestive tract, I should say. Um, and it ends up with this really like watery, runny diarrhea. Usually you can have some incontinence with it. It's really uncomfortable really smelly. You always can smell C. diff from a mile away. Um, and so um, at the end of the day, um, when uh, when it comes down to it um, with C. diff is, is that you want to really be asking this pa that your patient about, um, you know, if they're having any diarrhea when their last bowel movement was, the consistency, um, if they have any um, like inability where they feel like they can't get to the bathroom in time, because those might be your cues like, hey, something's not right here. Um, when, with antibiotics, this, and remember, these are all for all antibiotics. With all antibiotics, you always want to get a culture first, then give the antibiotics. And this is really important because if I go and um, and give an antibiotic and then get a culture, what's going to happen there is, is I might not actually get an accurate culture because that antibiotic has already started working and maybe killing some bacteria. Um, and so I might not actually know what is going on or what's growing, or it might say that it's negative, even though something was growing, but I wasn't able to do it first. Now, sometimes it's hard because sometimes it's hard to get a sputum culture, but we do our best. Um, always consider allergies because there's a lot of people that have allergies to antibiotics. So, um, you know, be cautious. And a lot of times if it's the first time patients getting an antibiotic, um, that first 15 minutes, if they're going to have a severe reaction is usually when you're going to see it. Um, the most common side effect with antibiotics is going to be um, nausea, vomiting, um, or GI symptoms. Um, so usually we want to give this with food um, and definitely consider that if they get it on empty stomach, they could end up vomiting. Um, so just be extra cautious with that if you can. Uh, people usually should start feeling better after three to five days, but if they don't, we want to consider maybe getting another culture or if they never got a culture, we want to get one um, because maybe the antibiotic we're using is not working because they should start to have some improvement within a few days. We want to always tell people to finish the entire course. A lot of times people take them until they feel better and that is not going to be effective. It can actually lead to a lot of antibiotic resistance. Um, people need to finish all their antibiotics, even if they're feeling perfectly fine. Um, and then it also can infer, uh, interfere with birth control and with a lot of other medications. So just know what other medications your patient is on. Um, and they may need a backup form of birth control. Um, you do not want an antibiotic re related pregnancy. So let's do an application check. Um, so a nurse is preparing to uh, administer a first dose of vancomycin to a client with bacterial pneumonia. Which finding would warrant further action from the nurse prior to administering this medication? So this is one of those times, if you want to do this question by yourself, go ahead and pause me. Um, and so A says the client, um, let's just say, is coughing frequently and is producing thick green sputum. So um, what do you call it? To me, that is 
sounds like pneumonia. Like it doesn't sound like there's anything wrong because really what this question is asking is, is what, um, which of these would warrant you to, um, or like re require you to stop or not give this medication or consider holding this medication? Like, is there any of these that is actually a reason to hold this medication? Well, to me, if my client is coughing and producing thick green sputum, that's a reason to give it because that's going to help with those symptoms. So next one is the client has a fever and is complaining of chills. So, you know, I mean, if they have a fever and chills, I mean, again, this is a part of having pneumonia. So I would think that that's expected. That's not a reason to hold it. Um, you know, having a fever is not going to stop this from working or lead to um, a dangerous situation. That's another way you could um, look at this question is which of these things, if the patient had this and I gave the vancomycin, it could lead to a serious complication or problem. Um, or the biggest complication or problem. Uh, so the client just ate a, a large meal containing protein for lunch. So some people might get um, choked up on this one because even though I said, hey, you know, you want to eat before, it says large meal. And some people that like that word, oh, a large meal and protein. Um, but that, that's no reason for them not to be able to receive their antibiotic. There's nothing about protein that can interfere with vancomycin. And if they had a large meal, um, you know, it might help. To, like, like I said, it's good for them to have something in their stomach before they get antibiotics. That only leaves me with one, but let's see if it sounds right. Because sometimes maybe there's something I read wrong with one of these. So it's always good to go back and, um, you know, don't just because it's, hey, it's the only one left. It has to be this one. Make sure that the other ones don't make sense. So the last one is the client's most recent creatinine level was 1.7. Hmm. What did I say about kidney function and um, antibiotics? I said that it can raise it. So this would require you to know a normal creatinine. A normal creatinine is generally 0 0.6 to 1.2 or 1.3. So this is elevated. Now, like I said, pharmacy is going to be looking into this. And just because someone has one doesn't mean that I can't give it. But I want to make sure because this is their first dose. I want to make sure that um, I, I might need to take some further action and make sure that the physician is aware of their creatinine um, before giving that dose, because sometimes doctors order things before looking at things, uh, looking at all the labs, and, and maybe these labs weren't back yet. I don't know. They haven't looked at them. Um, so I always want to um, double check and make sure that there's no um, different um, actions or uh, choice for antibiotic that they want to take since these are really hard on the kidneys. So the best answer here is D. Now, even if you like, you don't like it and you're like, hey, well, I'd still probably give it. Yeah, but none of the other ones are um, any reason to take further action. Like there's no reason I need to take further action. Now, you might look at B and say, well, a fever of 101.7, that's pretty high. Yeah, it is pretty high. Maybe I need to call the doctor about it, but it's not related to whether I can give vancomycin or not. So it's all about like, like um, you have to think about what the question's asking is saying, which of these are a reason not to be able to give vancomycin. Now, do I maybe need to call or do something about this? If that's new or different, maybe I do, but it's not going to stop me from giving the vancomycin. All right. So other medical treatments I'm going to do for these patients. Um, I'm going to, uh, my overall, um, you know, goals are going to be to get secretions up. So we may do things like CPT. We'll talk about that more when we talk about, um, COPD and things like that, um, but it's effectively, it's a way to like kind of agitate and get secretions up. We want to support good oxygenation and ventilation. Um, uh, we could, um, with like things like we talked about the incense of spirometer, which here it is here. Remember, that's the one where you, um, you exhale and then you take a big deep breath in. Uh, they may need supplemental oxygen therapy because this is an oxygen problem. We want a good, good oral hygiene to keep bacteria out of the mouth, um, keep less from going to the lungs, um, and then prevention with the vaccine, which I'll talk about next. Um, and then overall, I want um, them to have foods high in calories and nutrients. They can have nutritional deficits with this. And then I can give acetaminophen for pain and fever reduction. Um, and so... Um, uh, as a whole, um, I'm, pr I'm trying to keep them comfortable, get their secretions up, promote oxygenation, make sure infection isn't spreading, and make sure they don't have complications that they're um, getting uh, good nutrition. So the pneumonia vaccine or the pneumococcal vaccine, um, it's this is one that's a little different that you just get it once. Um, the people that are most at risk are those that are very young, and that's usually like less than age two, and those that are older, but also those that have certain medical conditions like a weak immune system, lung and heart disease, diabetes, or smokers, they're also at risk. So you just want to, um, for the pneumonia vaccine, you just want to know who's at risk and that they just have to get it once. Um, you know, uh, in order to, um, it provides uh, protection. So not everyone gets the pneumonia vaccine usually until they're older, unless they have one of these conditions um, or they're high risk, like autoimmune disease, things like that. So um, uh, the goals and nursing actions, things I can do is 
for the patient with pneumonia, help to get their secretions up, keep their airway patent. So I'm gonna encourage fluids. I want to thin their secretions to make it easier for them to cough them up. Um, it, these patients, again, maybe they got pneumonia because they had a um, decreased level of consciousness, things like that. Um, so I wanna protect their airway. So I'm going to do a really good gag reflex um, or a check or a swallowing study um, or swallowing um, assessment before giving them any food because I do not want them aspirating more or again. Um, as an ICU nurse, I've seen so many patients, they're on the floor and they aspirate, um, you know, because they're not actually swallowing well. So we want to be super careful. I'm not sure that I can put in a speech consult. I want to support good oxygenation and ventilation. So doing regular respiratory assessments, keeping their head of bed elevated. Um, so, and by the way, so this is showing the same things I had for medical treatments, but I'm showing you what you can do as the nurse. So you always want to be thinking as that nurse um, best that you can. Um, infection management, so good teaching around health habits, hand washing, adequate rest, avoiding crowds, um, and those that are sick. Um, small frequent meals, um, and again, those um, those nutritious, high, um, uh, highly nutritious meals, and um, support comfort and pain relief. Um, splinting and repositioning helps. And splinting, again, is where you're putting that pillow to the chest um, and helping to um, uh, bridge some of that pain that they're having from taking deep breaths. And then um, repositioning as well helps get spew them up and also can improve their comfort. And I have a video on how to teach splinting, but if you don't know how to do that. But anyway, thanks for putting up with my ramblings and my sarcasm and uh, my craziness. But I hope you enjoyed learning about pneumonia as much as I did. I'll see you for the next one.